So it's, uh, it's great to be back here again on In Conservation With. Uh, I'm David Lindo, also known as The Urban Birder. And with me again um, is Mary Colwell. She was here, was it as recently as, what, two weeks ago, was it, or last week? Yeah, it was no more than that, yeah. Yeah, last week or two weeks ago, you were talking about curlews. Tonight, we are talking about exams. Now, before we get into that, Mary, um, for, oh, by the way, before I even get into talking to Mary, this is sponsored by Leica um, Sport Optics. So thank you very much, Leica. Now, Mary, before we even get into uh, talking about our subject tonight, uh, are you still living above your bus station in Bristol? I certainly am, David. I wouldn't live anywhere else. It's a great view. <laughs> Quite that, noisy, but a great view. <laughs> and how have you been since we last saw you? Very well, thank you. Yeah, we've uh, we've uh, first week of easing up a bit, aren't we, in the UK? So um, at least we can meet people outside. Six people, I think. So we're all feeling, you know, mob happy at the moment. Yeah, I'm Deep sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, tonight um, we're going to talk about um, uh, the establishment or the possible establishment of a GCSE in natural history. And for those who aren't from Britain, a GCSE is a, a level of examination, and I'm sure. For, for school children, I'm sure that uh, Mary will actually sort of break that down a bit more. But you've been spearheading a campaign to have this um, qualification um, in our schools for young kids to basically understand and learn more about nature. Will you be actually covering this in your talk or in your your thing or do you, do you want to do you want to ask, answer the question now in terms of how did you actually come up with the idea oh yeah no I didn't actually put that in the talk um it was really strange I was in a um a meeting and T Tony Juniper actually who's head of natural England happened to be the, in this meeting and I, I don't know where it came from but it was almost like a just sort of sudden sudden thing and uh, we were talking about conservation and everybody was getting all sorts of you know, and I just suddenly said to Tony, well, why don't we do a GCSE in natural history? I have no idea where it came from. It must have been brewing in there somewhere. And, um, and he got really enthusiastic about it and thought it was a great idea. And he immediately went back home and wrote an, an article in The Guardian about it. And um, it kind of got a bit of a flurry. But um, uh, but it, it was that was 11 years ago now, David, 11 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So it's taken that long to um, of stopping and starting and sort of reaching dead ends and not knowing how to push it forward. And and um, I'll tell you about how it actually did get pushed forward when, when in the talk. But it was definitely it's been a long time with great big gaps where nothing's happened at all because I just didn't know what to do about it. I wouldn't know where to start, to be honest. So why don't we, I think the best thing is, let's, let's, if you can show us your presentation, then we can actually then talk sure. around it. Okay, thanks. So for those watching and not familiar with Zoom, the best thing to do is go into speaker view and you'll have a much better view of the actual talk. There we go. So thanks very much, David. Um, a GCSE in natural history. So anybody who isn't from the UK, this is the qualification that um, I think all children take at about the age of 16. And um, sometimes people leave school at the, after that, that. So it's the sort of standard qualification that everybody takes at about 16. And um, the idea of GCSEs, or whatever they're called, is that they're a broad spectrum of really important examinations. So um, in, in England anyway, you have to do the sort of maths and science um, in there. And then you get a whole group of other examinations around the outside that you can pick and choose history, geography, music, whatever, French, you know, language. And natural history is in that, that bit around the outside. So it's not a core subject. It's uh, something that you can choose to do when you get uh, for one of these GCSE examinations. Um, and so it puts GCSE not exactly, it doesn't make it core, but it makes it one of the options that you can uh, choose. And I'll explain why it can't be cool in a minute, but um, it, it couldn't be cool. No matter how much I wanted it to be, it, that wasn't a possibility. So there we go. So, so if environment, environmental education worked, we wouldn't be having the problems 
we are having. And that was an, uh, an educationalist and an environmentalist in America called Ray de Young. And, you know, he's right, isn't it? If, if we lived in a world which was nature literate, which understood the natural world around it and our place in it, I don't think we would be in this position. I think we'd realize just how important the natural world is to us and in the future. And yet, and we don't. And so we're in a situation, this is the IUCN red list, where we have more than 27,000 species threatened with extinction. And we're in a global um, climate crisis. So environmental education hasn't worked as it is. It's not working. We're not being told enough. We're not being given uh, enough information and we're not being given the tools to deal with it. So uh, I think that statement, if it did work, we wouldn't be having the problems as proof that it isn't and something has to be done about it. So children, I mean, this is lovely, isn't it? All children all messing around and looking at animals and uh, um, being very close to nature. But I would say that's not an image of most children's childhoods. I would say that they may do a little bit here and there, but a real easiness with the natural world is not something that most children now experience. Um, so to go pond dipping or uh, rock pooling or to have access to lovely creatures like barn owls is something that a lot of children won't have in their lifetimes. And that has big knock on effects. So in 2019, uh, a, a study came out which says that half of the children in the UK can't identify stinging nettles. Now, the reason I, I knew what a stinging nettle was and I knew what a dock leaf was is because I was always getting stung and I always was rubbing my leg with a dock leaf. But we don't live in that kind of, if you live in a city, it's all much tidier. There aren't those, those sort of rundown, you know, those sort of rubbly sort of waste ground areas that I certainly used to play in. And so we don't have that direct visceral contact with the natural world, even though it stings and bites and sort of scares you sometimes. That's all very much been uh, taken away. They don't, so children can't identify a stinging nettle, but it's worse than that. 50% can't identify a stinging nettle. 75% of children between the ages of five to 15 in this survey couldn't actually name a robin. That is an extraordinary statistic. I'll let that sink in a minute. 80% didn't know what a bumblebee was. And 90% couldn't say what it, what's a cabbage white butterfly. Even I know cabbage white is a generic term, but they didn't even know that. They couldn't. So I, I find that quite shocking. So half of our kids don't know a nettle, 75% can't name common birds, 80% don't know what a bumblebee is, 90% can't name a cabbage white butterfly. And these are things that we should see all the time, wherever you live, whether that's in the city or whether that's in the countryside. These are very, very common creatures. We're not talking about identifying a sort of great gray shrike or something. These are things that are part of our everyday lives. I wonder that would not have been the case when I was a child. So this has happened over the last 50 years. Over the last 50 years, we have had seen an absolute transformation of the natural history of the world, not just the UK. We have lost half, over half, I think it's now officially 60% of the mass of wildlife in the UK. So we don't, 60% fewer birds sing and flowers bloom and fish swim in the rivers and so on than 50 years ago. So we've had a real thinning out. They may not have gone extinct, some creatures have, but I'm not talking extinction, I'm talking of a thinning out of the common creatures of, of the earth. And in Britain, it's really, really obvious. So you don't get buddleias covered in butterflies. You don't get turtle doves singing in the, in the trees in your garden. You don't hear the cuckoo. You, there's many, in many parts of the country. 
there are many things where they just slipped away from us. They may not have gone completely, but they're much thinner on the ground than they used to be. So in the last 50 years, children have not only had less, less access to the natural world, um, but there's less of it to have access to. So let's do a little quiz for all you lovely nature lovers out there. And I haven't made it a bird quiz because I know that you know, David would be able to answer those. <laughs> so can you name just, just, just this, isn't, this is just a bit of fun. It's not a proper quiz, but can you name those common flowers? I could give you a couple of minutes just to look and you're a chat, you know, put them down. Can you name them? These are things you'll see all the time. It's going to be like, uh, I'm going to start a countdown clock in a minute. Are you all ready? Should we go on? Have you all had a good look? Okay, get your pen out to mark yourselves. So dog rose, honeysuckle, enchanter's nightshade, king cup, cornflower, scarlet pimpernel, forget me nots and ragged robin. Did you do all right? I bet, I bet, I bet this audio, <laughs> of course you did, David, you did very well. <laughs> but, you know, common wildflowers and I had to look them up. I had to look some of these up. We don't know the names of them. Why not? Why not? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great to be able to look at that and just think, oh, well, I, I know that I can name that as easily as I can name a robin and a blue tit. But we don't have that ease of language with the natural world anymore. And not only that, we've lost all the folklore and the sort of stories that used to be so attached to these things. So things like um, a forget-me-nots, for example, have so many little bits of folk tale and stories attached to them. They're supposed to be the eyes of um, the Virgin Mary, for example, all bright bl blue eyes with sort of nice bright pupils and so on. It, it's, um, there's lots of stories that just have just gone away from us and we don't know, we've lost that sort of enchantment with the natural world and we've lost the ability to name it and have a sort of relationship with it. Do you all know the sort of the migration routes of some of our migrants that commonly come to the country? Could, could you draw the migration routes of Brent geese, for example, or swallows? Do we know that? Is that an easy, and Brent geese are quite difficult because there's two populations. Did we know there's two populations? I didn't. I had to look it up and where they go to and how far they fly and what they need when they get here and how much of the population comes here. So how important is the UK for these long distance migrants and where actually are they nesting? It's really interesting information. We have the most wonderful migrants that come to this country and yet they sort of get, we don't, we don't marvel at it anymore in, in a way because We've lost that connection to it. Do you know the relationship? Another little quiz question. Come on, David, you know this. What's the relationship between these two fine looking things here? Just give you a minute to have a think. You've all got it, haven't you? <laughs> that is an Autoland bunting. And that is Beethoven. And the Autolan bunting has the most wonderful song. It goes, da 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 da, da 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 da. And what did Beethoven compose? He composed his symphony by listening to the song of the Autolan bunting. It, it inspired his fifth symphony. That's really important. The natural world isn't just something to look at and think, oh, that's nice, or oh, that's come a long way. It sparks a lot of our creativity and our imagination. Just think of the, some of the greatest paintings and the most beautiful literature and the poetry that's been written about the natural world. Where would we, what, what would spark that? You know, if we didn't have it anymore and we just lost that relationship. If, if nobody listened to Autoland Buntings, 
and went out to see them and sat. So Beethoven went every single day for long walks to sit and listen to nature. It's really important that nat nature speaks to us, inspires us, and makes us fully human. I, I would go as far as that. It makes us fully human. Yet, a generation ago, so that's that's me. That's probably David. You're you're a young. I know you're a young strapling, but um, forty percent of children played in naturally areas all the time, like woods and local fields, or just down in the park or something. And we played a lot outside. But today, statistics say seventy five percent of children spend less time out of doors than prisoners. Prisoners have to spend an hour a day outside. Most children don't spend anything like that amount of time outside. And 40% of children barely ever play out of doors. Sorry for the spelling mistake there. I find that really shocking. I find it really shocking. The Oxford Junior Dictionary uh, has recognized all these things I've just been saying and has removed words from its dictionary for the, this is the junior dictionary. This is for sort of teenagery, late sort of, I think about nine, 10, 11, 12 sort of ages, 12 to just going into secondary school. So it's removed acorn, adder, ash, beech, blackberry, bluebell, buttercup. You can read them for yourself. Panther, willow, otter, ox, oyster. Why? Why have they moved them? When asked, they said, well, lots of children don't have access to the countryside. And we put in new words which have much more currency for them. Things like blog and chat room and attachment. But they've taken away Bluebell. I think this is really serious. And this is what Robert McFarlane got really, the, the writer, the well-known writer, Robert McFarlane got very, very upset again about. He said beautifully, as he always does, the disappearance of words from the language of children is like watching water drying on a stone, it kind of just disappears and it's gone and it's like left no trace. It's really, uh, so he wrote his book, Lost Words, which he's trying to get into all primary schools and um, has done another one about enchantments and spells and so on. And he's trying to bring that, that wonder and awe and the sheer mystery and the tremendous stuff that, that young people feel when they have a relationship with the natural world. And where would we get things like sly as a fox and eagle-eyed and wise as an owl and courageous or brave as a lion and, you know, uh, hawks and doves and you know sort of they're like a viper they're peaceful like a dove where would we get all that from if we no longer feel we understand the natural world you only think sly as a fox if you've actually watched a fox for a while and you see it creeping around and it's got those kind of eyes and you think oh you know and you start to sort of your imagination starts firing you know the lion king it's sort of the way that that eagles and, and, and birds of prey are, are represented in literature as being this sort of far-sighted, quite ruthless thing. So we use the natural world to tell ourselves stories often about ourselves. The natural world helps us to reflect ourselves. It, it helps us to point out our good and bad points, if you like. And without access and without an understanding of the natural world, we will just become ever more self-regarding and internal looking. So it's really important that we keep these access, this access to nature for, for nature's sake, for our sake, for the sake of our cultural world. And that's why all those reasons was why I came up, as I just said before we started with the idea of a GCSE in natural history. And uh, Tony, that was 11 years ago now. So and then Tony Juniper wrote an article in The Guardian nothing I mean people got excited and there was quite a bit of chat about it and, and I started to try and talk to people I, I, you know whoever would listen to me I tried to talk about the idea and all I got was very negative no you know you'll never get a GCS a new GCSE through schools are under too much pressure 
Michael Gove had changed the school system, I think, uh, around then. And there was just a lot of negativity. So I kind of dropped it and gave in and just thought, oh, well, maybe, it, maybe they're right. But then I picked it up again. For some reason, I kind of came across some stuff and or maybe these reports were coming in. And I put out um, a petition and uh, uh, would everybody, what do people think? And I was trying to get to 100,000 signatures so that it could go and have a debate in parliament. But it got to 10,000 signatures very quickly. And then it was pulled because of Theresa May's snap election. And you can't have petitions running in an election period. So although um, it didn't run its full course, only got 10,000, that was enough to get a government response. 10,000 signatures, you get a response from the government. And uh, they said, um, we don't consider this as necessary. We believe that natural history is well served across the curriculum in the schools. So in effect, could you just go away? is what it said. So again, um, it had a little flurry in the papers. I think um, Michael McCarthy, who was editor of The Independent then, uh, environment editor in The Independent, he wrote an article about it. It got a little bit of to and fro again. The government said no. So again, I just dropped it. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I got contacted on Twitter by Caroline Lucas. And Caroline, she just said, what can I do to help? Give me, you know, I think this is a great idea. What should we do? So I went to meet her and uh, we got a bit of a plan together and she ended up being able to get us to go in, into the office of Michael Gove by, she has extraordinary political skills. And um, it, she, in a public meeting she had with him, she got him to agree to meet her and me and she did it in such a way that it would have looked really awkward if he'd said, no, I don't want to meet you. So he said, oh, yes, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you. And then she wouldn't let it drop. He tried to wriggle out of it, apparently, afterwards. But she said, no, no, it's on record. You said you'd meet us. And so he did. And she and I went to meet him. And he was then Secretary of State for the Environment. And I have to say he was immensely helpful, immensely helpful. And he put us on to the right people. He read the stuff we'd sent him. We'd sent him lots of material. He'd actually read it. Um, he'd made notes on it and he came up with really good suggestions. He introduced us to a top civil servant who he said might be a useful contact. And we went and had a, a meeting with him and then this civil servant put us in touch with OCR exam board, who the OCR exam board have a very good relationship with the Department of Education. And so just through just that one meeting with Michael Gove, which Caroline Lucas orchestrated, opened the doors. Suddenly there was a pathway and it was all happened really quickly. And we had a meeting with OCR, a lovely guy called Tim Oates, who's head of their development, so to speak, the Oxford and Cambridge exam board. And he said, yep, he happens to be quite an outdoory kind of guy and he likes natural history. And he said, yeah, I, I, I get this and um, I'll help you. That was it. I can't tell you the words, his words on that meeting. I get it. I think I'd like to help. It was just like amazing. I didn't, I, was, I just wanted to kiss him, but I didn't. But it was such a, a, a moment that I thought, at last, I've got a pathway through, at last. And so we set about um, doing the really sort of stuff that you have to do. I had no idea what it takes to get a GCSE through the system, none, zero. And so um, Tim started to talk us through, we have to have aims, we have to have the scope of it, we have to sort of show that there's nothing similar, we have to do all sorts of paperwork and lobbying and talking to people and coming up with all sorts of sets of things that we had to do. And Tim and I often met in London and we sat in cafes with a huge pot of coffee and we just worked it through time to time. We had lots of phone calls. This is pre-Zoom days. <laughs> you remember those? Pre-Zoom days when nobody met online like this. We all had phone calls and conference calls on the phone. And it seemed like suddenly we had a plan. And then OCR said, well, now we've got, we've developed it to this stage and we've got aims and we've got the sort of scope of it and so on. What we have to do next is a public consultation. And so we put the word out to schools through the networks that these exam boards have, come and have your say. Everybody was invited, come and have your say. 
Public consultations for GCSEs happen, not many have happened in recent years, but they do consultations for quite a lot of things in education. And uh, Tim was saying, well, I think we could probably expect 200 maybe people to attend this consultation and, and reply. And he said that would be a reasonable number, 200 people. We don't normally get more than that in our consultations. We had over 2000 people replying and wanting to join in and have their say. And uh, we held a day, um, an afternoon, and there were lots of little films made. Myself and Caroline and a few other people made little films. Then we had a forum where Stephen, the, the presenter, Stephen Moss, did a question and answer session and people could ask, uh, ask questions. And then we had a whole sort of day of discussing the GCSE. And this is the little film that I made. It was in lockdown. We had to do it all in lockdown. Remember last spring? So it was all filmed in my garden and um, my husband filmed it. But this is my little film that appeared in the public consultation for the GCSE. In some ways, it feels like we're all in a hot air balloon and we're drifting further and further away from the Earth, losing connection. We may have a better view of the planet than we've ever had before in human history, but we've lost touch with locality, with the world. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. And what that wildlife is telling us about the wider world. Survey after survey has shown that children can't even name the most common trees and birds and wildflowers that live alongside them. They have no relationship with the natural world. That's not only bad for their own mental health and well-being, it doesn't bode well for the future. Because what this pandemic has shown us is how much we need nature and depend on it but also what happens when we disrespect it. Already the earth has lost 50% of the mass of wildlife on earth. Half as many birds fly and sing, half as many bees buzz, half as many wildflowers bloom as 50 years ago. So we need naturalists for the future, people who understand the workings of the world, we need young people to be able to name, observe and record the world around them. To be able to collect data and know how to use that data. And understand how British natural history connects us to the rest of the world. But this GCSE will do far more than that. It will explain how nature has inspired so much of our art, music and literature through time. And you don't have to live in the countryside to do it. There's so much in the city as well. Good young naturalists of today have become fascinated by the natural world because someone has inspired them and taught them. This GCSE will give young people a bedrock of awe and wonder which will see them through the whole of their lives. Britain has a long history of studying natural history. We are a nation that loves the natural world and yet that history that heritage we're in danger of losing on our watch. If we don't have a thriving natural world, we can't thrive ourselves. We also lose an incredible source of inspiration and joy. That's why I'm passionate about this GCSE in natural history. I know it isn't a silver bullet, but it is a step in the right direction to connecting young people back to the earth, engendering a sense of awe and wonder and love being able to study it scientifically, but also having an emotional connection. So thank you for contributing to this GCSE consultation process. We need your ideas to make it as robust as possible, but also to help us make it have a sense of fun and joy. Thank you very much. In some ways, it feels... So that was it. It laid out what I want this GCSE to have. It will, and it will teach young people to name, to record, to monitor, to collect the data on the world around them. It will help them to know how the, 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 the local environment is connected to the wider environment in this country. 
and how being connected to the wider environment in Britain connects us to the rest of the world. So you get a, a sense of, of what's around you and how we fit in to the big picture. And it will also help us to understand the inspiration that the natural world provides to our cultural lives. We are very poor at data at the moment. We've so many species we don't have enough data on. I know that from my curly work. We are so poor in data. So the more people we have out there collecting information and really rigorously well collected data will help us plan for a richer, more greener future. Because if we don't know how to monitor and record and, and see how things are doing out there, we're not gonna know what we're losing. It's really important we have naturalists. So that was the, 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 that was the public consultation. There was quite a few films like that. Um, and then everybody responded and it was all brought together in this infographic. So 90% of the people said they agreed or strongly agreed with the definition that we put of natural history. 96% said it was important to study it outside. 93% um, expected some time outside. So, you know, it was a really high positive thing. And number one, the most popular content was flora and fauna. That was so heartening to see that, that the most popular thing that everybody who responded said was, I want to know more about plants and animals. And I thought that was spot on. So it was a really useful, in, it was a really useful study to get all this information uh, from that public consultation. And not only that, so we thought, great. And so we're at the point now where the GCSE has all been fiddled with. And after that uh, consultation, it was tweaked with and strengthened. It went back to the Department of Education. They had a look at it. They commented a bit, come back again, had more tweaks done to it. And finally, it's gone in as the final submission. It is now finally with <clears throat> the Department of Education. It has gone directly to the minister. It's even went up to number 10, apparently, uh, for them to have a look at it. I said, is that unusual? And they said, very unusual. So I don't know what that meant or didn't mean, but now it's sitting in the minister's red box, but he hasn't made a final decision yet. He said, because of COVID, um, we've got to wait. He's got too many things to sort out, like this year's exams, um, like the, the awful situation that was come out recently of what they're going to do about a lot of bullying and harassment in schools and so on. So I totally understand that there are a lot of things on, on the minister's plate, but we need him to say yes, because if this has any chance of getting into schools by September 2023, which is what we would like, uh, we've got to start on it now, because it takes a long time to do it properly and rigorously and to train the teachers and, and get everybody tooled up. So it's going to take us that long. So we do need him to say yes as soon as possible. But we were given a bit of a boost because <clears throat> during this period of, of development of the GCSE, um, I wasn't aware that Professor Dasgupta was writing a big tome, a big assessment of the contribution, contribution natural history, biodiversity makes to global economies. And the Dasgupta report came out in February. It was a subject, it was a multi-year study and a huge contribution to understanding how nature contributes to global biodiversity, to global economies. And part of that, I got a, a, an email saying, would I like to take part in a round table that was going to discuss the role education can play in this whole sort of greening our economy. And, um, and when we started off, uh, Professor Dasgupta was at the round table and he said, look, he said, um, uh, I don't even know that education is going to appear in this report. It might not because it might be too tangential. This is an economic report. Um, but I think it's worth exploring as how education can help support all the changes that I want to see. So in the end, um, he asked me then after the round table to write um, a sort of, if you like, a sort of proposal to him. He, 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 when we'd all spoken, he said, he got in touch with me afterwards and said, will you just write what you said? And I did, and I sent it in. And then when the Dasgupta report was published and presented in February, 
the very last thing on his on, on his presentation was this. I filmed it off the screen, so it's not brilliant quality, but this is the this is where education ended up in the Dusk Up to report. This is finally, finally, before I finish my presentation, I would like to say this. The review ends with a plea that our education systems should introduce nature studies from the earliest stages of our lives and revisit them in the years we spend in secondary and tertiary education. The conclusion we should draw from this is unmistakable. If we care about our common future and the common future of our descendants, we should all in part be naturalists. That's me, David. Thank you. Well, um, I thought you were great before, Mary, but I think, you know, your determination, you are a credit. I must say that straight away for your determination to to try and push this through. I mean, obviously, there's been some good people helping you along the way, but I think it's a, a massive thing you're doing and it's important. I think also to tonight, we should shake it up a little bit and maybe get some questions in now because I know there's lots of people with thoughts and and questions. I have my own as well, but maybe we can talk for the next few minutes um, with a few questions. Um, I wrote them down as I came up in the chat. Dennis, um, you mentioned something quite early on. Um, do you want to uh, sort of reflect on what you mentioned earlier? I, I cannot believe that prisoners have more time outdoors than kids. It's, that is sick. Agreed. Agreed. And uh, I wonder why it must be to do with safety. It must be to do with lack of green. I mean, I, I have a school that I have some sort of council flats that are just below my house and a school uh, inner city school right at the top. So the kids go walk up and down past my house every day. And, you know, they're full of life and they're very noisy and they're very, you know, they're, <laughs> they're real presence around. And I just wish they had a field to go and play in, you know, that they could just go at the end of school. You do, we all remember that feeling, don't you? Where you just want to, you just got that pent up energy. You want to have a chocolate bar and you want to go run around. And, and I just feel so sad. They've got nowhere to go. And, and it's, they'll just go from school back into their flats and I, I've all hanging around in the city. And I, that is not a childhood to me. We need to make it possible for kids to get out. Yeah, when I, when I was a kid, it took forever for me to get home because I was distracted by so much stuff. I, I agree, I agree, Even but it just doesn't, might be different in America, but that's not the case here for a lot of children. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dennis. Um, Chris, I know you always has you always have uh, some questions lined up. So, Chris, can you jump in now? Hello, Chris. Hi there, David. Hi there, Mary. Um, good to see you back on again. Um, I think just stuff like what Dennis was saying there. Like when I was a, a kid many moons ago, um, I sort of thought I lived sort of near the coast now, but um, I, I think like now it's like down to technology. Because when, I say when I was about 12 or 13, home computers came out. And um, I remember at the time I was living at my grandparents for a little while. And um, I'd have an hour or two on the computer. And then my grandfather would like kick us out of the house. He'd say, right, you multi bar kid, get yourself like down to the, down to the beach kind of thing. Um, and I think now it's phones, games, consoles. Um, it's just too many excuses. It's just like that keeps kids occupied. So it's an easy like win for parents, possibly. I don't have kids, so I'm just surmising here. But um, I think like technology now is an easy out for for parents. So that's just like a view from like what Dennis was saying. But um, you know, I think what was I going to ask? Um, in terms of like the, the GCSE, I think one thing you were going to touch on before was like why it can't be necessarily for like pre-options. And I'm sort of curious about that. Um, I think, because, um, sorry. Yeah, so I think like 
that would be, I suppose, they like get to a wider audience or you know, more children. Um, but obviously it sounds like the systems are such that that can't take place. So it's an next best option. And then also it was I'm um, gonna ask, is it gonna be like say UK natural history based, or would it be a, a more sort of like a wider sort of worldwide based sort of look at natural history? So the, the first question, why it couldn't be a core subject, is that the government uh, told us very firmly that they want to protect the maths, physics, chemistry, biology, English language, English literature. That's what they consider to be the very basics of, of, of education. And they don't want anything to threaten that. So they thought if we put natural history in there, um, it would take attention away from these others, that it would split the crowd, so to speak, that it would make the system not work as coherently. They didn't think it, it, they said, well, you know, we've got biology. Well, I said, well, biology isn't natural history. Biology is different. It's a wonderful subject, but it's not natural history. And they said, no, but basics of biology are what you need and you can then choose to do natural history. They wouldn't be budged on it. And we wouldn't have got anywhere. They would have dismissed it if we'd insisted it yeah. being a core subject. So you just have to take what you can get quite honestly. Um, um, you know, that doesn't mean to say things won't change in the future, but it wasn't a goer then. Yeah. Um, in terms of would it be wider, at the moment I just consider it to, to be British natural history and how British natural history connects us to the wider world. Um, and of course then you can just go on and, and learn a lot more. I mean, I think we'll have trouble getting just British natural history and it's so exciting and diverse, so. Yeah, I guess um, if it's British natural, natural history, it's, um, like kids can connect easier because yeah. the things they'll they'll see sort of if the you know if there's a field trip somewhere or you know yeah. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Is there also sort of a role for you know a member of like some of the wildlife trusts yes. and things like yeah. that and um WWT for them, I don't know like sort of like what level or RSPB, what level of sort of schools programs they have and maybe to sort of like link and say, right, okay, we're going to have a trip to, you know, an RSPB yeah. reserve today and, you know, do some pond dipping or, you yeah, know. Yeah, there'll be all that, yeah. Kids yeah. babies, but, you know, is there the sort of, like, work like that to be done? To, you know, sort of, um, so the sort of practical experience as well as the sort of classroom-based Yes, of work. course I will. I mean, you couldn't do natural history without practical experience. And, um, and how those kids will, the kids will access that <clears throat> will probably depend on where you live. So it might be RSPB in one place, it might be WWT in another, it might be the Wildlife Trust yeah. in another, but whoever can give access can give help and they'll also be providing materials to teach. And, you know, it'll be a mix and match um, all over the place, but certainly the teachers will be taught as well and given instruction how to do it, but they'll definitely be strengthening relationships with nature societies or nature groups, wherever they are, they're, they're absolutely essential, I think. Great, Fab, I know it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the sort of the journey through and um, yeah. your, your, your dedication, so well done. <laughs> or complete dogged, sort of. <laughs> I know, it's uh, very <laughs> admirable, and, um, <laughs> you know, obviously just what was uh, required to <laughs> get it where it is now, so I hope that's rewarded. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your question, Quiz. Quiz, sorry. Thanks for your question, Chris. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Ahead of the next question, I just wanted to sort of say. Um, I mean, Mary. Um, for me, it's a no-brainer. Um, I think that the government and their response to you saying it's not core cool because it, it may pull people from the from the main science subjects is a bit of a a, a a bit of a concept that they don't understand personally because for me those subjects you know they are very specific and they're very you know obviously scientific this subject to me is something that introduces a building block that we all need as you've expressed in in your film by the way you've got a fantastic estuary in your garden i must say um <laughs> you. you know it, <laughs> for me it kind of builds it's a building block, which is an, a necessity, as far as I'm concerned, as, as as necessary as maths, as necessary certainly as English. Um, and what people like the government don't understand is the fact that 
nature is not something you walk off into the middle of the countryside to access. It's all around us. And I've had a similar experience to you in that my Vote for Britain's National Bird campaign, I started a petition to ask the government if it were possible to ratify the robin as being a national bird. And I've got, similar to you, I've got about 11,000 people um, respond. The government came back with some lame um, answer, which was, we think this is not necessary because people can go into the forest to see the robin. And to me, that just said it all. They just have no idea, they're not connected, they don't understand. And that's the problem, connection. 82% of people live in the UK, living in the UK live in cities and urban areas. The connection needs to be right on their doorstep. And there still is this perception which is sold to us. And I keep on going on about this across all the in conservation moves I've done. But there's this perception that, you know, you have to be in the middle of nowhere. And it's sold to us by the media, i.e. the BBC, Natural History Unit, all those guys, as something that is away from us, that, you know, you have to have special access to gain. And most people think, well, you know what, I'm never going to see that. So I'm not interested. Um, so for me, this is so important to get people to realise, kids to realise that, you know, there's this whole thing around us, which is actually connected to everything. You know, it's all part of a massive myriad, it's, um, um, including us. And that's something that needs to be told and, you know, needs to be taught. And I'm, for me, the most distressing thing in your presentation, apart from the fact that 80% of people didn't know what a, a, a bumblebee was, which I find incredible. Um, was the fact that so few people just, you know, like the Oxford Dictionary, cutting out all those major words like magpie. I mean, it's just it's just sickening. But anyway, um, we move on. Um, Jim, did you have something to say? I know you always do. Um, yes, uh, I suppose I do. Th thank you, uh, Mary, for that. That was really enlightening. I just wondered if your own MP or other... MPs as well as Caroline Lucas supporting this campaign? Um, <clears throat> I think nobody uh, uh, particularly vocally apart from Caroline. So um, I think she said, I mean, she says she's been asking around and talking to people and I'm saying, oh, it's a good idea, you know. But um, to be honest, I didn't contact that many other people because I didn't want it, to, I didn't want it to become something that became political. Um, I just wanted it to, 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 in a way, Caroline was fantastic and really brilliant at, at getting us access to the people in power. And, and then in a way she was great because she said, right, you know, use it. it, it other MPs, there's no, I haven't come across anybody who was against it, but nobody has done what Caroline did and say, how can I help you push it forward? Don't know why, I, I don't know mm -hmm. why. But I bet if you wrote to them and said, you know, I'll vote for you if, if you do, they probably would. <laughs> right. Can I ask one other question? And that is, um, although I, I agree with you entirely in principle, I'm just a slightly concerned that uh, if the subject is poorly taught, you could put a dead in the interest of children and put them off. I, when I was at school, I regarded natural history as an escape from school life. I, I'm not sure I would, I would have welcomed it actually in the, in the curriculum. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you could say that about any subject really, couldn't you? If it's badly taught, it puts you off. I think that's that's just that's just the rough and tumble of education. Um, would it, but no, I mean, I think if that depends how we design the course, you know, if it's, if we make it something that you just think, wow, it's just so interesting. And, and the response we've had back from young people is I want to study this. And the response I've had from people who are, you know, you know, grown up saying, if only I'd been able to study that, I would have loved to have studied. I can't tell you the number of people that have written to me saying, can I do it as well as an adult? So I, I hope you, you know, you might be right and it might be a disaster, but we've got to do something, Jim. We've got to do something. We've got to get people more engaged with nature. And this could be one way. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it could be one way, but something's got to happen. Would you have a say in shaping the curriculum? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Always lovely to see. Lovely to see you. Um, next up is my old friend Louise Bentley. Hello, Louise. Oh, hi, Louise. <laughs> You're on mute, Louise. Yeah, I'm, I'm here now. Hi, Mary. Hi, hi. David. 
Um, yeah, so uh, so I spoke to a friend of mine who's got he's got a real passion for natural history, and he is um, a high school teacher that teaches uh, geography, and he he's just concerned that would some of the natural history content that is currently in the sciences, like biology, for example, be taken out because of the new GCSE, which would only be for a narrow band of students. Well, uh, no, is the absolute answer to that. Good. And also, um, <laughs> there's not that much natural history in geography. Well, I was wondering, yeah. But there isn't. I mean, if you talk to my, my kids have been through the system, you know, not that long ago, and they really don't do this naming, recording, monitoring, observing, collecting data. They do, they understand about systems. They do, you're not saying that, you know, the subjects are great, but it's not that level of contact with natural history. So there's nothing to take out, to be quite honest, or very little. And I can only see stuff being put in to support it. So as the, the, there is a general move towards greening the curriculum because um, we're going to have to do that right across the board. So I see it as um, adding in, not taking away, definitely. That's brilliant. I'm really excited about it. As no, I say, I, I want to study it anyway, just as a little <laughs> hobby know, if it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, yeah, thank, thank sorry, thank you, Louise. Lovely to see you, by the way. Um, uh, what time is it? Izzy, do you want to come on and quickly uh, ask your questions? Hi, um, I was just wondering if there would be anything like this for A-level. Well, yes, I mean, wouldn't I love that? And I've been told, uh, I have tried, honestly, <laughs> I've been told we, we just get the GCSE first before you start going on about A-level. And I want to have degree levels as well. I want degrees in natural history because there's no such thing at the moment. You can do zoology or something, but that's not natural history. So, um, yeah, I'd love to see it from, you know, prime preschool right up to degree level um but i've been told just to sort of wind your neck in and let's get the gcse through first but i'm not letting that one go is he so great would you do it yes good woman that's what i like to hear <laughs> okay thank you very much izzy um actually we've got time for erica erica a few uh are you off mute and ready to roll? Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you for having me today. I'm an interloper here. Um, I'm here to say hello to Mary again. Um, I totally, I mean, I totally agree with this. I teach in, in a humanities department in a field called animal studies. And it's part of a greening the curriculum that's happening within the humanities. So rather than animals only being present in the natural uh, sciences, you can now study animal studies, eco-criticism and things like that. And I think, there's a huge uh, conversation that we need to have with each other. And the point I made in the chat was about cities. And I think you know it's a point that's already been made and it's an obvious point. I live in the center of Glasgow. Not only has Glasgow Green, where I live close to, been incredibly well used during lockdown in a way it's never been before. You see teenagers out in parks in a way they haven't been for a generation. I have seen a seal in the River Clyde. I've seen a seal pup banked on the edge of the River Clyde while his mother fishes. There are cormorants, there are herons, there are rabbits, you know, so it's not, again, it's exactly what you said, it's not that you have to go a long way, and I think you could almost see this as part of local history as well, which I think gets people's interests straight away, and the point about, you know, children not being allowed out on their own, no, absolutely, there's a worry about that. This would provide an environment where you would have professionals, whether it's teachers, the natural naturalists, the charity organisations, whoever, to kind of be there, not just as experts, but also as the reassurance to the parents um, that they don't want their children running free because of all the potential threats or perceived threats. So I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea. And I think, you know, get the GCSE, get the A-level and we'll go for the degree. I'm absolutely on that one. And when you say uh, people coming to support, Erica, lovely Erica, um, said she's going to um, help us get it off the ground in Scotland. So good on Erica. She's been fantastic so far. So we're doing that, aren't we, together? Yeah. I mean, we're in the I middle do. of election, so that's interrupted everything and COVID, but we are, I am going to be back on it come later in May, for sure. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Erica. You're not uh, an interruption or interloper. You are 
very welcome and it's fantastic you made those points thank you very much okay um i think we come to the natural not natural it's very unnatural actually because we can we are talking we're going to be talking more but in terms of the first part of this whole broadcast we've come to an end uh, let me just quickly tell you zoomers that on monday we have um one of britain's best bird photographers here david tipling talking about his art which is going to be great um you may find that there's no one else on there at the moment on my site but in fact a lot of things are bubbling under or bubbling up even we've got um, a gentleman called sam lee who's written a book on nightingales and he's going to come and speak about all things nightingales um we've also got a lady called kate norbury or catherine norbury um, and she's written or collated a book called women in nature and it's a whole load of different um, sort of uh, pieces from women across the centuries and their reflection on nature. So that would be really interesting uh, to hear about that. And also we've got a lady called Sarah Gibson who's written a book on Swifts. And she'll be here to talk about Swifts. So we've got all that coming up and more. So tune in. Keep on tuning in. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for another fantastic evening which uh, will continue uh, and for those who want to see the continuation you'll have to become a member of the urban birder world membership club all right more details to follow but um, thank you very much for tonight really appreciated it and it's been very inspiring and you are a legend as far as i'm concerned oh thank you david thank you it's been great to see everybody Zoomers, um, great to see you as well. Thank you for coming along tonight. I know it's over Easter and you've got loads of other things to do, so it's great you made the opportunity to come. And for all those people watching in the future, thank you. Uh, don't forget one thing, though. Keep looking up. <laughs>